So for our afternoon, I have the privilege of moderating. I'm Lainey Ross, for those who don't know me, one of the co-directors, uh, associate directors of the McLean Center. Uh, this afternoon, our first panel is going to be on ethics consultation, and our first speaker is going to be Ellen Fox, who is the Chief Ethics and Healthcare Officer for the Veteran Health Administration, as well as a physician in internal medicine, whose areas of expertise include ethics consultation, professional standards for ethics consultants, ethics education, ethics evaluation, organizational ethics, and ethical issues in end-of-life care. So we could have put her on every single panel for the whole week. She also leads the National Center for Ethics in Healthcare, which is VHA's primary office for addressing the complex ethical issues that arise in patient care, healthcare management, and research. Welcome back, Ellen. Thank you, Lainey. It's great to be back. I missed last year, so it feels kind of like uh, coming home again, and thanks to Mark. Yes. So I'm going to be uh, talking today, yes, that's mine, thanks, about the uh, use of several tools to improve ethics consultation quality. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people on my staff who are involved in the work I'm going to present today, but I'd in particular like to acknowledge Dr. David Alpandre, Kenneth Berkowitz, and, and uh, Barbara Chanko. Um, I'll be describing three practical data collection tools um, to improve ethics consultation quality, along with a few highlights of data uh, that I hope will demonstrate how these tools uh, can be used to measure and, and ultimately improve ethics consultation quality. Um, to put this in context, um, these tools are part of a much broader initiative called Integrated Ethics. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, I presented on it at this conference um, probably several times, but uh, um, it's a comprehensive approach to ethics in healthcare. It's a model that we've implemented throughout the VA healthcare system. And uh, it really applies principles of business management, quality improvement, systems redesign, organizational change thinking to uh, manage and improve system performance in terms of ethical practices. So it's sort of a different way of thinking about ethics in a healthcare organization. Um, and the um, ethics consultation is literally in our model the tip of the iceberg, and I'm just going to be talking about a some of the tools that we have relating to ethics consultation. So these are really three tools from among dozens of tools that we have uh, that make up the broader initiative, and I'll just give you a, a hint of some of the um, activities. Um, in order to pr improve quality, you have to first establish standards, which is something that sometimes uh, folks have been reluctant to do in terms of ethics consultation, to systematically collect and analyze empiric data, and then to use these data to target quality improvement efforts. The first tool I'm going to be talking about is EC Web. I presented about this a uh, couple of years back here, I think, and I'm just going to be updating you on some things that some data we have there. And this is a uh, sophisticated web-based software program that we use to track and trend ethics consultation throughout our system. Um, to, this just is to give you an idea of, uh, of the first screen that you get in EC Web, and I'm not going to have time today to talk about all the different things the program does, but um, um, it's a relational database that's currently used by over uh, 1,700 ethics uh, people performing ethics consultation in VA, and those folks are working individually or in groups, and uh, it's based on CASES, C-A-S-E-S, -E which is the, an acronym that is the uh, standardized approach we use for ethics consultation. And in total, there are, I believe there's uh, more like 6,000 consults now uh, from our 139 medical centers and other uh, facilities entered into the database. So here's some data. Um, this graph shows um, the total number of consults per quarter over time from 2008 through uh, 2010. Our fiscal year just ended uh, at the end of September. And um, so this is the volume of consults. And you can see it's been 
rising steadily over time. Uh, we now have about 500 new consults per quarter. Um, and uh, I can't tell you whether this is actually an increase in the number of consults or whether this is just an increase of the usage of EC Web. I suspect we are uh, approaching 100% usage of EC Web um, in our system. So we may be seeing this flatten out. Um, and, but I can say that, uh, you know, I can't really say anything about quality here other than to say that if you're using EC Web, you are using a standardized and very consistent and thorough approach to documenting ethics consultation. Um, it allows, the system allows us to measure any number of different variables. Um, and I'll just uh, give you a couple examples. So this graph shows the uh, percentage of consultations that were requested by individuals from the outpatient setting. And this percentage has been gradually increasing over time um, from 23% when we began measuring to uh, roughly 30% uh, nowadays. And we've also seen um, similar rise in, for example, the percent of consults that come from mental health relative to medicine and, and more, some of the more common services. And this is really uh, in the integrated ethics model, there's an emphasis on integrating ethics across all parts of the organization, inpatient, outpatient, nursing home, et cetera. And so we see this as an uh, improvement um, to not just have consults in your inpatient um, settings. EC Web also allows us to measure a variety of steps involved in ethics consultation process measures, such as whether the attending physician was notified, whether the patient's decision-making capacity was established, et cetera. Here's a couple examples there. This is um, whether the first line is uh, whether the cons consultant documented what we call the ethically appropriate decision maker. This is a step in our model that we think is important. And uh, as you can see, that's gone up gradually over time. The other example is um, identification of underlying systems issues. So one of the steps, again, in our process is consultants are supposed to actively review each case after the end of the consult to determine whether it suggests underlying systems issues. And so we've seen that number going up gradually over time here from 33% to 44% identified underlying systems issues. Those are just a couple examples for EC Web, and I'm going to move on to the second tool. So this, uh, an important aspect of ensuring high quality ethics consultation is to satisfy the needs of the, uh, those involved in the consult, the customers or clients. And so we systematically collect feedback uh, on the consults. Um, this is our feedback tool. And I'm going to show uh, some data from this. Um, we encourage consultants to seek feedback on all consults. And um, this is the, per the percent of the total take case consultations for which we have at least one evaluation. And remarkably, um, we have uh, almost one third of all case consults in our system throughout our country are now evaluated. And that's rising over time. And I think that's a pretty remarkable number. Um, in terms of the results of those evaluations, this graph uh, shows how staff rate their overall experience with the ethics, oh, this, this is staff data I'm giving you, overall experience with the ethics consultation service. And uh, on the y-axis is the combined um, percent who rated um, good or very excellent uh, overall for the, their experience. And here we've gone up uh, from 76 to 88 percent overall. But uh, you'll notice there's an interesting um, shape to this graph. Um, and I'm going to say a little more about that. We were curious when we saw this, couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And if you, if you think about it, what it really appears to be is there's a rather steep slope upward. Uh, and then there's a sudden fall, really. And then there's another steep slope upward. There's actually other data that, that supports that same shape. And when we looked to try to figure out what was causing this, uh, this is what we found. This is a, the number of case consults that were evaluated in our system. And so the arrow marks where we actually made a change in practice, and we asked um, our, our uh, facilities to start using evaluation data and do an improvement plan that year. And you can see roughly 
there was roughly a doubling of the number of facility of the uh, number of case consults evaluated. So what we think happened is sort of the early adopters in our uh, who were evaluating things voluntarily early on were probably the better programs, and they they got better, even better, and then it dropped down again when more programs were evaluated, and now we're seeing it come up again. Okay. And I'm getting the time signal. I didn't realize I was. Uh, okay. So this is the same pattern for um, other aspects of the same um, instrument. You can see here we're up to 95% in terms of uh, being timely enough to meet your needs. So the final instrument is a, a self-assessment tool for consultants based on the um, ASPH core competencies, and they rate themselves on number of knowledge and skill areas. So this is um, how consultants rated themselves on identifying the nature of the value, uncertainty, or conflict underlying the needs for, need for ethics consultation. You can see 5% thought they were novice, 55% uh, basic, and 40% advanced in terms of their skills. And we've provided education on this particular skill, and so this makes sense. Uh, contrast that with moral reasoning and ethical theory as it relates to ethics consultation, and you can see their ratings are a little worse here. Um, not so many, uh, a lot more people rated themselves novice. And we haven't had quite as much emphasis on that in our education. And uh, another example, here's how our consultants rated themselves on shared decision making with patients in terms of content knowledge. Most of the consults that we have on a national level are in the domain of shared decision making, so that's a good thing that they think they're competent in that area. Only 2% of our consults are on resource allocation, and here you can see a different pattern where there's uh, less uh, uh, confidence in people's um, competency in that area. Um, I'm going to I think my time is up, so I guess I'm going to have to uh, skip this slide, but there are certainly a lot of limitations to all the data I've presented today. So um, these are practical data collection tools. They are available uh, on the Internet uh, along with um, other tools that are free for you to use, um, with the exception of EC Web, and that's uh, our computer program. We would love to... Um, be able to make that available, and we're trying to figure out a way to partner with other organizations and get funding to make that happen, but we haven't been able to do that so far. Uh, we're going to have a lot of data published in a special issue of American Journal of Bioethics uh, in the coming months that will cover a lot more of the integrated ethics data in our system. So, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Robert Rohr, who is co-chair of the Healthcare Ethics Council and senior fellow at the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity at Trinity International University. He is professor of bioethics at both the Graduate College of Union University and Trinity International University and a professor of medical ethics at Loma Linda University. He has also chaired the Council on Ethical Affairs of the California Medical Association and was vice president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. Uh, Dr. Orr today will be talking about a comparison of methods of training clinical ethics consultants. Well, thank you, Lanny. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to the McLeans. And thank you to Liz and Kate for putting this program together. Uh, I'm one of the few people here today who was present at the very first McLean conference 23 years ago. And I've been back for probably more than half of them. And some things have changed over time, like the size. Some things have not changed. Like when you put Mark in charge of the clock, the program goes to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> <laughs> now, for those of you who came from a great distance to hear the talk that was uh, published in the um, brochure, you're going to be disappointed because that's not what, exactly what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about instead how to grow an ethics, a clinical ethics consultant. This is a more focused uh, question than was, than was um, uh, advertised. And it's a, a part of a, a presentation that I gave uh, in Amsterdam last spring. So the question I'm going to address is, of the various training programs in clinical ethics, what factors are associated with actually doing bedside ethics consultation after the training? And I don't need to show this slide to anybody in this room, but I'm showing it for a purpose. Clinical ethics is the identification, analysis, and resolution of moral problems that arise in the care of an individual patient. In the consultation process that I'm talking about, 
is the individual consultant model, as we learned here, uh, with a formal report on the chart, discussed at a weekly <clears throat> multidisciplinary clinical ethics case conference for accountability, with a short summary to the ethics committee to look at educational opportunities, policy issues, and so on. Uh, Wayne Shelton, who I think is here, um, <clears throat> He and I, there's Wayne. He and I uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Ethics a couple of years ago a piece about uh, the process of doing consultation and format for writing a report. And that format includes, of course, the demographic, demographic information, the question that's being asked, the narrative, the story of what's going on, then an assessment, which is a brief, and this is the hardest part for students to pick up, but it's a brief summary of the clinical situation and of the ethical issue, and then a discussion broken into two parts, a generic discussion about the, that ethical issue, then an application to this case, and then some recommendations. And you'll see that that fits nicely with the, with the definition of clinical ethics because our, the identification appears in the assessment, the analysis appears in the discussion, and the resolution, hopefully, in the recommendations. Now, I chose to look at only the seven ethics training programs that I've been involved with over the last 20 years. Uh, the first was, of course, one year here at uh, University of Chicago, full-time, 12 months, uh, full-time fellowship. And I went to Loma Linda and helped to establish a, a master's program. I taught the clinical part of it. And the clinical part uh, was a seminar format that lasted for two quarters. Then I was in, and continue to be involved with the uh, master's program at Trinity University just outside Chicago here, which the clinical part is really quite condensed. It's, it's an intensive in just one quarter. Then when I went back to the, when I went to the University of Vermont, I uh, put together a faculty training seminar so that I could get other people to do consults with me. So that training lasted 10 months. And we've had two mentoring um, experiences, one in California, one in Vermont. I'll tell you a little more about those later. And then Bob Baker's online program from Union Graduate College in Schenectady. <clears throat> I've been teaching the clinical part of that, the practicum, which is one quarter online. And then a fellowship experience that we've just completed at Loma Linda, uh, training uh, five clinicians to do ethics consults. That lasted for two years. So what are the variables in these programs? Well, the purpose of the program, not every program in clinical ethics is designed to develop an ethics consultant. The duration of the program, quite variable. Whether or not it gives academic credit. Who are the trainees who come into the program? What's the content of the program? And what's the consultation experience? So I did a very short survey <clears throat> um, asking participants which program and when. What was their position at the time of the training? Primarily were they clinician versus non-clinician? What was their content, their, excuse me, their consult experience prior to taking the training? If they had done some, what model was used? Then their consult experience after the training and um, what model they used. Had a 63% response rate. And I might just mention that <clears throat> those who surveyed, um, you see only six at the University of Chicago. Those are the six who were in the year that I was here, 89, 90, um, didn't inquire of all of you folks for a couple reasons. One, at the time I was doing the survey, the, the um, database here was being upgraded and really was not available, so I could send it out. And the program has changed significantly since I was here. So it's more uniform to look at just those six. So uh, 179 surveys went out, got 113 back. Still confusing slide, but it's really quite simple. Some preliminary conclusions. Programs associated with the highest percentage of ethics uh, consultants among its alumni are undertaken by clinicians, are longer in duration, have more patient contact, and have more consult write-up experience. And of those programs, I've highlighted three in red, which you cannot see. The highlighting is not really going to help you a whole lot. But the University of Chicago program, um, went from, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to look at this, <clears throat> went from um, three who did consults before to all six doing consults afterwards. The mentorship, um, one person in California, one in Vermont, uh, neither one had done consults before, and they both did afterwards. And the fellowship program we've just completed at Loma Linda, <clears throat> five 
clinicians came into the program, and all five were doing consults afterwards. So looking at just those three, we had 23% who were doing consults before their training and 100% afterwards. Now, just to look at those three programs. And again, this was the McLean Center program, 1989. <clears throat> the purpose was to train physicians at that time in the theory and practice of clinical ethics. No academic credit. The trainees, the year that I was there, uh, were all six were physicians. The content, weekly seminars, university courses, rounds, teaching, supervised consults, weekly case conference, research, and publication. The, con the consult experience varied quite a bit. Uh, I did 26 consults during my year here. Uh, some did only two or three, but everybody had some um, consultation experience. Skipping on to mentorship. <clears throat> In California, the director of the pediatric ICU approached me soon after I arrived there saying, you know, I'm convinced that I'm doing some things that are unethical to these kids and need some help in working through this. So he spent a year working with me, um, learning how to do consults, learning how to do the issues. And in the first two years I was there, I did 58 consults in pediatrics. And then right after that dropped way off because he was then comfortable doing the consultations. Um, and I knew when I got a consult from his unit, it was going to be a, a zinger. Then in, um, when I went back to Vermont, um, I did that faculty development seminar first to get some, some colleagues. But then I recruited a, a young physician, a pediatrician, who was also an Episcopal priest and had an MA in ethics from Oxford, but he had no clinical ethics experience. So over a period of three years, um, well, actually two years of mentoring, and then by the third year, he took over the program with my planned retirement. That's my first retirement, which I failed for the first time. I've since <laughs> failed the second retirement. <laughs> um, and he now directs, directs the program there. Neither one of these... Uh, got academic credit, they were both physicians, and the content, uh, as you can see up there, was, was fairly intensive, and they did a lot of consults. The fellowship that we've just completed at uh, Loma Linda involved five physicians, and I was asked specifically to train physicians in clinical ethics to join the ethics consult service. Because after I left in 2000, I left two people that I had trained in charge of doing consults, and one left the institution the other got overwhelmed and busy with other things, and so the consult service was, uh, not doing as, was not as robust as it had been. So I was asked to come back and train five physicians. Again, no academic credit. These trainees, they were all faculty physicians, and they were given 10% time, uh, freed time, uh, to do um, ethics, and some of them had graduate training in ethics, others did not. We had biweekly seminars with long readings, <clears throat> Uh, they practiced writing up consults. Done? Okay. Um, and they did, they did a lot of, ex lot of uh, consults. A couple of personal observations. The quality of analytic thinking increases with the number of cases discussed, whether that's in a seminar or in case conference. The, qualitation, the, excuse me, the quality of the consultation report increases with the number of reports written whether practice reports are real. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Our next speaker is Susan Toll, who is the Camelia Hayes Stevens Endowed Chair in Healthcare Ethics at Oregon Health Sciences University. She is a practicing internist in the Division of General Medicine and Geriatrics. Susan founded and has directed the Oregon Health and Science University Center for Ethics and Healthcare since 1989 and has successfully gotten three endowed chairs in the program, um, as well as has a very robust program. Today she's going to be speaking when re resuscitation is not the most important question. Welcome back, Susan. It's wonderful to be back. I was a fellow here in 1988-89, and this is my 21st McLean conference. And you've grown, Mark. Uh, we were much smaller then. This year, I will focus only on things that have happened within the last month, because so much is happening with the Physician Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment Program that will focus 
on an article that was published this month in JAGS on a article that is in abstract form only but will be published and I can only share with you what is in the abstract and a lawsuit that was filed last week. I do not make money on the POLST program, an opportunity to fundraise for it and support it. Um, so how anyone completes a POLST form requesting or declining or a mix of both does not benefit me financially. The POLST program has grown since we last spoke of it here in this context and in fact has grown since I made the slide a couple of weeks ago with Montana now being an endorsed program. Endorsed means you have all core elements, you're working with your EMS, you have a functional coalition, you have no laws or obstruction, and you have a plan for rollout even if you haven't extensively rolled out yet. Developing means a whole range of things from you have a coalition meeting to you really are very near the level of endorsement. And 20 states are in the process of development. What I'd like to argue over the next eight minutes is that the action within a post form, which is called many different names in many different states, but the action is in section B. That section A, which discusses resuscitation for a post appropriate population, people with advanced illness and frailty. Post is not for healthy people. POST is for people who may be long-term residents of nursing homes, they may be enrolled in hospice, they may have advanced frailty and be in a retirement community with a walker, that this group of individuals has an extremely low level of success if resuscitation were attempted, and whether or not you want it, it's not going to have a very substantial impact on your long-term outcome. Section B, however, will have a profound impact on what happens in the next months of your life, and it will help determine the location of your death. This study examined 90 nursing homes with an equal number of pulsed and non-pulsed using nursing homes in Oregon, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. 20 people in each of those 90 nursing homes. Traditional practices meant you did not use pulsed and you had traditional DNR orders or whatever orders you may have written in your chart but there was not a structured format, and compared to an equal number of facilities using the POLST and looking only at Section B. You can see that slightly ahead of any other category for long-term care residents, that limited interventions was the most frequent one chosen. I want the easy things done. I want to go back to the hospital, treat dehydration, treat my pneumonia, don't send me to the intensive care unit. I don't want to be intubated. And if you look at the number of long-term nursing home residents who actually wanted full treatment and wanted to go to the ICU, it's 12%. So when we ask people and record what they want, long-term nursing home residents typically do not want ICU care. Now this looks at what happened during a 60-day period of time for people however they had marked their pulsed form. Remembering that people who mark comfort measures only tend to be a little older and a little sicker than people who mark that they want more treatments. So the opportunities for hospitalization are actually greater in the comfort measures only category because they're a sicker, more frail group. They had a 67% reduction in hospitalization and ICU visits in a 60-day period of time for those with a pulsed form. The newest study, which is in this month's Journal of the American Geriatric Society, looks at every single inconsistency. If you had pulsed orders in a 60-day period of time, how often were those orders not followed? For resuscitation, almost half of the residents in the study died. Not a single one received CPR who had a do not resuscitate order. Not many people get CPR in long-term care if they have a resuscitate order. That appears completely unrelated to POLST. That appears to be traditional practices in nursing homes for unwitnessed arrests. Comfort measures only, though, is a option that was 
um, recorded more effectively with the PULSE program than traditional practices. And when people are transferred to the hospital, the first presumption is, were their PULSE orders ignored, or was there an excellent reason why the transfer was done? Of the patients in this study from the 90 nursing homes, 35 were transferred to the hospital when they had orders for comfort measures only. Of those, 26 reviewing the records, we had an excellent identifiable reason why the transfer was needed for comfort, would not stop seizing, fell and broke their hip. In fact, half were trauma. And something needed to be done for their comfort that could not be managed in the current setting of chair. So 74% of the time in the record, we found an identifiable excellent reason why the transfer did occur and should have occurred and within the design of the program what we would have desired. There's a lot more data in that article and I'll commend you to take a look at it about what happens if you say limited trial of artificial nutrition. The bottom line is you're likely to keep the feeding tube. So there are certain things that go beyond that. Uh, but the numbers are quite small, and in general, pulsed wishes were remarkably well respected. This is the next um, study. This one is in abstract form only. I will not be able to answer further questions beyond the slide because it is embargoed. Um, this is a study that is the first study led by Eric Fromey um, of the Oregon Pulsed Registry. The registry has been in effect for less than two years. This is the first year where anything signed and dated within the first year of registry operation was included in this study. How do people use the form? It's from all settings of care. Oregon has about 32,000 deaths a year, and during that first year, 25,000 post forms were submitted, which is remarkable for something that's just getting started that you're educating about statewide and did exceed our expectations for the first year in the registry. To date, we have um, just over 80,000 post forms submitted to the Oregon Post Registry. This is what a broad sample of persons with advanced illness and frailty in an entire state look like. Most people are over age 65, but we do have newborns, children born dying, but only about 1% of the population is under age 18. Majority are female. We have a lot of nursing home residents as part of the study and the registry. Majority of people have a do not resuscitate order, but it is only three quarters. It's not all. What I want you to look at for just a moment is if you mark do not resuscitate or I want resuscitation, you tend not to mark the same thing all the way down that very few people mark, I want everything or I want nothing. Um, the typical is to want some and not others, and that the PULSE program really allows for the mixture of what people want. Because it's published in another place, and monthly we report to the state on the registry, and it's available on the website, I will tell you that 10% of forms coming into the PULSE registry every month are revisions of someone who has an existing form. This is very much a living document. Things do change over time. And this is the major findings reported in the abstract. If you know code status, you know code status. You do not know if the patient would like to go back to the hospital in Section B, and it's exactly 50-50. Do you want limited interventions, which is the larger category of the two, and go back and have the easy things fixed? Do you want ICU care, which is the smaller of the two? Or would you prefer to stay in your current setting of care and have the focus on your comfort? That you are completely unable to predict whether the patient wanted to go back to the hospital or not if you know that the patient had a DNR order. Our appeal is do not resuscitate does not mean do not treat and that when you know code status, that's really all you know. It should not be used in any way to predict whether or not the patient wishes to return to the hospital. There's a lot more information about the PULSE program at PULSE.org. 
about each individual state, about each individual contact, and it's exciting to see Illinois be a developing state since I was here last. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for all your mentorship. Angela Bradbury sends her regrets, and so we're going to continue with uh, Dr. Alberto Federes, who is a professor and chairman of surgery at the University of Buenos Aires. Dr. Federes was an international guest scholar of the American College of Surgeons, and is the appointed chair of the Department of Surgery at, at the hospital. Uh, Dr. Carlos A. Ocalandro in Buenos Aires, Argentina, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you, Mark. First of all, I want to recognize my clinical ethics fellowship, which was a landmark in my academic career and in my personal life. Let's move to this. Nothing to disclose. And this, the preliminary um, answer to the question is yes, exception made of special situation of circumstances, and it depends on what we explain and how we explain. This statement may be very funny, but it reflects the different approaches to the issue of informed consent, and we must struggle to get some uniformity and that the goals of the informed consent process be known and be the same for all participants in the care of patients, including those who are going to judge sometimes our behaviors, and that's what I mean by the judicial system. Uh, take into consideration that we, in Argentina we are enduring a huge litigation process, especially from the criminal point of view, so decisions can go to jail. That makes a big difference. This is a lecture plan for this small uh, this lecture, and we are going to start with the uniqueness of surgery, and that's the, what makes the difference between the, cons the informed consent and the surgical informed consent. Surgery harms before it kills, it's invasive and penetrates the patient body, as was recognized by Judge Benjamin Cardoso. So we are committing an assault, so we have to have the patient permission or his or her surrogates. Besides, surgery is prone to error. Fallibility marks our everyday activity. Our decision making is many times, especially in the acute care situation, under uncertainty. That was all times and now in new times, you have to rely on the internet. And besides, we have morbidity and mortality. That means incapacity or discapacity. So we have risk, errors, and complications. So the surgeon patient relationship is unique. For many, it's a contractual agreement. But for many others, it must be fiduciarism. What relies on this is trust and faith between patient and physician or its desertion. Ronald Katz was the former chair of anesthesiology at the UCLA, and he put this into words. Honesty and integrity of physicians and a good patient-physician relationship based on fiduciarism. But who started with this concept of fiduciarism in the patient relationship? We have to go back to Scotland and to the figure of John Gregory, who was the one who introduced the concept of medicine as a fiduciary profession. He belonged to a family who were known as the Gregory Academics. He was not a physician. He was professor of philosophy and medicine at King's College, and he mm, professor of practice of physics at the University of Edinburgh. And he told us that the physician must be in a position to know reliable the patient's interest, should promote and protect the patient's inter interest, and only secondary, promote and protect his own interest. So this is very present and actual. Let's move to the surgical informed consent process. There is, this is not the process. This is just a piece of paper. Maybe it has some legal value but that's not what we are looking for. We are looking for an informed, illustrated, and educated consent. If we turn back to our classics, let's see what Hippocrates told us. He recommended to conceal most patients, most things from the patients. 
Plato, it's interesting in the laws in book uh, 11, I think, he makes a distinction between the slave doctor and the free doctor, and this is the first term of informed consent. He will not prescribe for him until he has first convinced him. And Oliver Wendell Holmes simply stated, don't be consistent, simply be true. There is a big difference, as I, as I say, between the informed consent just for giving a pill or a medication and the surgical informed consent. And in this relationship, the surgeon has a role as an authority due to his background, his expertise, his wisdom, his skills. But the patient is in authority to say yes or to say no. That means to refuse or to accept the proposal or just to seek another consultation. And here we see the preconditions, the information and the consent. An important point regarding the information is this is not a menu of options like you go to a restaurant and you have a choice. The surgeon has to make a recommendation. It, we, we do not work or act or propose a surgery according to the patient's desire. We have to have this in. There must be an indication, and we do not need to perform unnecessary surgery. Applebaum and Griso related and described the abilities of the patients, which are really very important, but usually we find clashes between what we try to explain, especially we biased, are biased to risk and complications, while the patients have more simple interests or concerns, especially pain, period of disability, some sequelae. <clears throat> what do physicians, especially surgeons and anesthesiologists, think, or which attitudes do they have regarding the informed consent process? S stands for surgeons and A for anesthesiologists. 22% of surgeons consider that dis disclosing information about potential harmful risk may be worrying or disadvantageous. The anesthesiologist 22, and there you can see the difference in a recent publication. What do we need to inform our surgical patients? Everything according to their capability, common risk or very serious risk, but we do not may need to make them stressful before a huge operation. If we are going to perform a cholestectomy, we can give some type of information, but we are, if we are going to perform um, a bile duct repair after a bile duct injury, the situation is diametrally opposite. The standards have been described. The regional physician standard, the regional patient standard, they have moved to the subjective standard, basically solely on a specific interest of what the patient considers, and I think that we have to switch to another position, which is the balanced model, based on the most important and relevant interests, values, and goals of the patients, as has been identified by both the patient and physician, and that's the reason why the informed consent is not a piece of paper or legal document, but the process. Let's move to competence and capacity. These are the definitions according to the Oxford Dictionary, but mostly capacity is a legal consideration, while a competence is mostly a cognitive neurological assessment of the ability of the patient to understand. But this complicates because we thought that it's just one consent, but according to this publication by anesthesiologists, the, a patient can be capable of giving surgical informed consent, but not be in condition to give anesthesia consent. I haven't understood very much with this, but I would recommend reading, because they, they can provide some insight. Let's move to the cognitive status of the surgical patients. We are not speaking about the patients who is under re uh, respiratory distress with mechanical assistance, but just the one who is going, uh, entering, walking our office. I work in a state-run hospital at the University of Buenos Aires in two of, their ho of the hospitals of the universities, and we have been trying to see the educational level in 400 patients who were uh, mostly um, perform uh, GI tract surgery. And we have a huge proportion, 71%, people having only primary education. Then we move 
to evaluate them from a cognitive point of view using the false state, the minimal state evaluation, and those are the results. Though we have an propor important proportion of normal and subnormal ranges, the people were really very happy and very mm, satisfied with the process of informed consent. And one of their perceptions as it was that they were receiving too much information regarding risk and complications. I did not like to listen to that many times. Here you find the correlation between the minimum mental state evaluation and the degree of education of these 400 patients. <coughs> these are all preliminary data from my um, research team. And this is the impairment of function that we have found having um, patients achieve one or more of those. But maybe you are surprised by the incidence of lack of recall. But just make this experience. Ask one of your patients who has been operated if she or he remembers the name of the surgeon who took the operation. And you will be surprised because 90% will not recall the name of the surgeon, maybe the institution, but not the surgeon in chief or the one who was in charge of the operation. Move, let's move to health literacy and comprehension. That's the definition given by the IOM 2004. And this is a paper from the Veterans Administration, Dr. Fink is from Emory University, where the strongest predictor for comprehension using a um, web-based um, tool is total consent time. Many times this is difficult to achieve because one receives a patient for an operation and we just place a schedule for one month time and there is not the possibility to achieve a very good patient-physician relationship. This is the realm um, published by Davis, and we have studied another cohort of our surgical patients. These are, just to remind you of the different score, the 0 to 18, 1944, 45, 60. Um, it's written level compar comparison. And this is the education level we have in 550 surgical patients. This is from this year, data from this year. And this is the modified realm test in this group of patients where most belong to the inferior scales, less than six grades. Nonetheless, all of these patients were really 98% of satisfaction with the informed process. Some of the opinions you can see in the literature are the ones you, have, you can read in this slide. And this is a recent paper, a meta-analysis, regarding how much and what do patients understand. They include only 23 studies for surgical informed consent. Those are the issues they were looking for. And the conclusions were the following, that the adequate overall understanding by the patients of the various aspects of the surgical informed consent reported in less than one-third of the studies and the degree may not in fact be satisfactory. And that an appreciable proportion of patients may not comprehend the risk of the proposed surgical intervention. We are not discussing it, it's useful, but they do not understand that. And this is more recently, and this pushed us to m make a modification, a change in our popul surgical population, so we relied in PowerPoint presentation, but we offer groupal um, sessions for our patients, and we have encountered a great success for example, for morbid obesity surgery, for gallbladder disease, for colon cancer. So we gather a cohort of about 30 to 35 patients, and we, we listen to all the, pay, the, the questions which are referred from the different patients, and the satisfaction is really very high. In conclusion, uh, I will paraphrase this Salgo versus Leland Stanford Board of Trustees uh, verdict, 1957, the first time that the term informed consent was used in, in the uh, legal literature. One is to explain to the patient every risk attendant upon any surgical procedure of operation, no matter how remote. This may well result in alarming a patient who is apprehensive and who may, as a result, refuse to undertake surgery, in which there is, in fact, minimal risk. It may also result in actually increasing the risk by reason of the physiological results of the apprehension itself. And the other is to recognize that each patient represents a separate problem. 
that the patient's mental and emotional condition is important and in certain cases may be crucial, and in discussing the element of risk, a certain amount of discretion must be employed, consistent with the full disclosure of facts necessary to an informed consent. Last but not the least, more communication, open and honest on both sides, and patients should be VIP, very informed patients. Thank you very much. If I could have all the speakers back up for a panel, and we're opening the floor for questions. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Ferreras. Uh, so I actually had the privilege of uh, coming to your operating room in Buenos Aires and visiting with you, and I was struck when I was there by um, a different issue from the consent process, but just the, issue, the sort of approach to privacy and that really, in terms of my being there and visiting, that patients seem to have or, or seem to uh, feel that that was less important for them. And so I wonder if... Um, you commented on education, but I wonder to what extent you think culture actually um, changes kind of the issues of consent and other, other things that patients here seem to really place as top priorities and maybe not so much in your uh, practice. Actually, I have to deal with the everyday patient, mostly literate or with a very low uh, degree of um, literacy. And... In the afternoon, according to our practice in, our, in my country, I have to move on private practice. So I have a different approach the way I, I mm, provide information. Uh, but by the end of the year, the difficulties encountered by the informed process are more or less the same in the literate, in, 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 in the population which I take care of in the hospital and that mm, patients, which, uh, those patients which I take care uh, in my private settings. So it's only a question of time and um, the development of faith and trust between both parties. This is not an issue you have to discuss in the courts. Uh, it's, a, it's only time. It may be one more consultation. Uh, I'm now in, in, a time, in, in, in a situation which I can employ maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It's only a question of time and to develop a bond, a real bond between the patient, his or her family, and that's, I think, it's a very important point, and at least for um, our um, population and the healthcare um, group. Um, hi, my question is for Bob. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Bob. Um, in the last two decades or so, whenever I've been on a hiring committee for an academic position, in medical ethics at the Faculty of Medicine, we get scores of applicants, uh, most of whom have impressive credentials. And I've been on a hiring committee for a clinical ethics position at the bedside in a hospital, uh, we're really hard pressed to find anybody with, in whom we have confidence that they can go right in there. So I'm reading into your conclusions and it seems to me that when we want somebody, your slide seems to suggest we either have to train him ourselves or we got to go back to the McLean Center graduates or possibly the University of Toronto Clinical Fellowship. Um, I don't know if that's true. That's my impression. It seems to corroborate what you're saying. I wonder what you folks think about that, and I'd be also curious about what Mark thinks about that two decades later when we need help at the bedside. Uh, the graduates have to train them or we have to go back to you. Most of the academic centers seem not to be giving us what we need. Is that a fair judgment? It's an interesting question, and I, and I think my mind, when you ask that, my mind goes back to the uh, Society for Bioethics Consultation meeting in St. Louis in 1989. And up till that time, there was really two camps, the clinicians doing consultations and the philosophers or humanists doing the consultations. And at that meeting, there was really a, a rapprochement between Dr. Siegler and John Fletcher saying, whoever is going to go to the bedside needs to have training and or experience in both medicine and ethics. And which is primary is not that critical. Uh, and I think that was a good platform to set. Um, in my, my own experience in, in these several programs, I think clinicians grab onto the ethics concepts more quickly than non-clinicians grabbing onto the medical concepts. 
So that's why my bias is towards uh, clinicians, which includes physicians, nurses, social workers. Um, but I've known several non-clinicians who do excellent bedside consultations as well. Uh, your slide that showed 26 of 35 were transferred out because um, they couldn't get the comfort care they needed in the place. Did, did they receive anything beyond comfort care? Were they transferred back? Were you able to track that data any deeper? In looking at the 36 people, the people who were transferred um, but had marked comfort measures only, 26 of them we identified the very specific reason. And in the JAGS article, each one is listed as to what the reasons were. Um, they did not go on to get, for example, intubated. Um, that portion did work well. And, uh, and later, if there's time, I'll tell you about the lawsuit about Pulse that just got filed last week. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ellen and Bob, um, question sort of for the two of you together, because you both talked about uh, ethics consultation. Um, Ellen, it sounds like you have... Um, a large cadre of people doing ethics consultation in the VA. And so maybe in light of that previous question, where did those people come from? How were they trained? And how does that relate to what Bob said and vice versa? We do have um, a large number of people who are involved in consultation. Um, we use primarily a team approach. And so in each hospital, there's a small team of consultants. And they um, really have a fairly minimal amount of training, and they're essentially uh, self-taught and supported by a very robust set of uh, standards that they're expected to follow. And then they, um, if they get into trouble, they call our national center for the difficult cases. Um, I don't know if everybody knows that there's a, um, we now have um, a joint fellowship program between VA and University of Chicago. We have uh, three fellows this year, they're over there, and uh, at least one from last year here so far today. And, um, and so we are, but we see those people as uh, sort of regional leaders. There aren't that many people that we have in our system around the country that have that high level of knowledge and skills. There's probably less than 10 in the country other than the people, you know, I've got uh, 29 people on my staff, not all of them are ethics consultants, but, um, you know, in the national office we have highly trained consultants, but not so much in the facilities. And I would say, um, you know, corresponding to the study that I published in AJOB in 2000 six or whatever it was, seven of, um, of uh, a random study of U.S. hospitals, the model you're seeing in VA is very similar to what the usual model is in the country. And it's the academic medical centers, which are not that many in number, that are complete outliers among uh, the 6,000 hospitals in the country. Uh, at the Oregon Health Sciences University, we train our own ethics leaders and we deliberately go out and recruit and we have a two-year educational program that's very intensive and no one sits on our consult service who hasn't had at least a year of formal training in ethics. Ron Miller, University of California, Irvine. Uh, for Bob and others, uh, what data, if any, are there about the efficacy of consultation by <clears throat> clinicians versus non-clinicians on the one hand and by uh, <clears throat> consultants, individual consultants versus teams versus committees? I'm not aware of any data that addresses this. Uh, there really aren't any. We did a review for the core competencies uh, report. Um, I wrote the draft of the chapter on evaluation. We looked systematically at the data. That was like a little over a year ago that that was published. Um, the only thing, the closest thing I know of is that study I just referenced that um, we did where we have things like, you know, it's, it wouldn't go to quality um, or efficacy, but we have some comparative um, data. So, for example, you can say it takes longer in terms of person hours if you use a, a committee model than if you use an individual consultant model. But there's no data, uh, comparative data I'm aware of in terms of 
satisfaction or any other uh, quality outcomes? Most of the training programs I've been involved with are actually training people to do consultations. But I've trained a number of people who I would not recommend to do consultations. Um, <laughs> so much of it is a personal personality, interpersonal relationships, and so on. And I've had some people complete training that I have done uh, asking for a reference to do clinical ethics consults, and I say, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. So a lot of it has to do with uh, the person as much as the training. Uh, I'm Abe Schwab, uh, philosophy department at IPFW. And I have a slightly different question, um, and maybe it's a little unfair, but after spending about 15 years studying and working a little bit in clinical ethics and bioethics in Chicago and New York City, I moved to a uh, town of about 350,000 people in Indiana, and there, the problem is the opposite problem. That is, I'll meet a doctor, and they'll be like, oh, you study clinical ethics, we need somebody like you, right? And, but, you know, I'm not a doctor, and I'm, you know, still working on getting to the position where I can actually get into the hospitals because, you know, they have concerns about the care that they're doing and about how things are going. And so I guess rather than ask the question how you grow a clinical ethicist, my question is how do you plant a <laughs> clinical ethicist? <laughs> And I don't, I don't know if that's a fair question or not, but that's at least the worry that I have. It really depends on experience, um, going to the bedside and doing consultations. And how do you get there if you haven't had that experience? I'm not sure. Um, but affiliating with a, um, a hospital ethics committee and, and stepping forward and being willing to work, serve on a subcommittee or whatever may, may get you there. But uh, I don't think there's any, any substitute for going to the bedside. I mean, I teach two online courses. And I told Bob Baker when I started teaching for him, you can't do this online. I mean, this has got to be done at the bedside. And so there has to be some, uh, some compromise there. Um, I teach the residents from internship, PGY2, PGY3, five hours each year on seminars on ethics and professionalism. And one thing that comes out very clear is that the PGY1s, when they see their residents, senior residents, twos and threes, demonstrating the ability to resolve ethical conflicts. It creates a very different learning environment where the stress and the moral distress is greatly reduced. And so I've now used Mark's book to really teach principles in conflict resolution around ethical conflict to help develop a set of competencies that can create a more optimal learning environment. So one, my question is, do you think that ethical consultation needs to become now a core skill that we need to teach our residents in a more systematic fashion? And secondly, in the era of performance measurement, do you think there's enough data, um, both Ellen and Susan, to look at criteria around performance of ethical consultation and end-of-life care? First of all, Preston, I think a rising tide lifts all boats. And that the more we're able to educate a large number of faculty and change the culture and the climate and the expectations, and my personal interest has been changing the culture of end-of-life care, primarily in my state, and by reaching out to a lot of other people with similar passions, giving them tools, uh, and helping provide resources there will always need to be someone to help with the very toughest cases, whether it's palliative care consultation for someone whose symptoms we can't manage, or whether it's the ultimate conflicted family that requires an extremely high level of skill. And so I think we won't outgrow a job. We'll just be doing the toughest end of the whole spectrum when we teach our communities a higher level of skill. And that's what we find. Um, but in the error performance measurement, Chris talked about 240 measures being used by Medicare for physician quality reporting. And I sit on the ACP's performance measurement committee, and we've reviewed 600 measures over the last three, four years, and most of them are crap, absolute crap. So the thought that we're going to use these measures for accountability is very, very, very worrisome. But Ellen, you're now creating an enormous database that's looking at very concrete measures for how to do this well. And does that now need to be 
really standardize in terms of what you expect out of your consultation service? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's tough to evaluate quality of consultation. Um, and we're actually just now embarking on a project to try to do that, to look at uh, the content of consults uh, as opposed to just process measures and so forth um, to see if we can score them. And, um, and I, you know, we're already making progress. We have some dimensions to find and, you know, we're going to be looking at inter rate reliability and so on. That's fairly work intensive. I mean, I actually think where the money is or where the, the best, uh, out, uh, you know, bang for your buck is in terms of evaluating systems performance in terms of ethics is not going to be in terms of the content of the consult. I mean, I'm with Bob that, you know, I would rather have a completely untrained uh, person who just has a good sense of things than somebody with a whole bunch of training that never had a good sense of things with regard to consultation. So, you know, I, I'm not sure about whether we need, well, enough said there. But, but in terms of uh, practice, I think there's a lot of things you can measure in terms of ethical practices. And we're, we're measuring some of those things. We have not in the consultation component of our integrated ethics program, but in terms of the what we call preventive ethics, which is quality improvement cycles, we're measuring all kinds of things about privacy practices, uh, you know, talking to patients, uh, informed consent practices, um, even uh, resource allocation practices. You can actually measure lots of behaviors um, and I think those things are probably better as measures of ethics quality of a healthcare organization than focusing on the consults alone. And with regard to the lawsuits, um, last week the first lawsuit that I'm aware of was filed in California related to failure to follow a post form. And this lawsuit involves, uh, and all I know is reading the lawsuit. I don't have any inside knowledge of the case. But the lawsuit involves someone who had a brain tumor at age four and at age 18 was completely incapacitated, continuing to be cared for by her mother in Southern California. She was a Kaiser patient two months before the lawsuit was filed a detailed conversation had taken place between the mother and the care providers that were the long-term care providers with her daughter and a post form was completed. The post form said, do not resuscitate and limited interventions. So she wanted to go back to the hospital to have seizures treated, those kinds of things, but did not wish to be intubated, did not wish the ICU. Was aware that her daughter's illness was reaching its most advanced stages. The daughter was found to be comatose, and the mother um, took her to the hospital. We do not know the details of what was happening at the time. We do not know the perspectives from the emergency room physician. The daughter was intubated over the mother's uh, verbal objections and um, calling attention to the fact that there was a pulse form, whether it was reviewed or not reviewed. In the Kaiser electronic records, since it was filled out two months previously, should have been accessible. Um, and um, the uh, young woman was intubated. The mother um, pleaded, and that they were transferred to another Kaiser facility where life support was withdrawn, and she died the next day. So the ability to litigate this. Uh, and Dudley says is likely in a much more powerful position than disputing whether or not an advance directive was followed. A little bit more details? I was unaware, uh, Ron Miller, University of California, Irvine. I was unaware of the case until so Susan told me last night. My only information is from a blog by Thaddeus Pope, a uh, lawyer who has a futility blog, and <clears throat> he indicated that the <clears throat> physician who intubated the patient was in a Kaiser-affiliated hospital, not a Kaiser hospital. And it seems to me the devil's going to be in the details here, number one. Number two, that uh, I want to be sure that Kaiser appreciates the importance here. In fact, had an ethics consultant involved in the discussion leading up to the Pulse form, 
and has made a huge effort at hiring people in ethics consultants throughout their system. Great, thank you. Well, the other thing to remember is that 10% of the Pulse forms entered in the registry every month are revisions that people do change their mind, that there are revocations, and until we hear everything on the other side, it is indeed possible that something uh, is not as clear when you hear just one side of the situation. And the Oregon regs related to following polls, and some other states are adopting very similar ones, indicate that you follow what you have until or unless you have information to the contrary. So we don't yet know if there is some information to the contrary and a change of heart in some way, um, but it is indeed worrisome and will clearly put a spotlight on the Pulse program and issues related to not respecting it. Great. Well, I want to thank the panel for a very interesting panel.